agreements with the minority legislators on the routes for their September 5th protest march after minority members earlier reported reaching consensus with the service. In a statement detailing the outcome of the meeting with the minority leadership, the Accra Police Command says security assessment of the agreed routes revealed possible disturbance to public order and public safety, among others. The police say they have requested the leadership of the minority to relocate their routes and destination of picketing. The statement ends by saying they are awaiting a response from the organizers on the request for change of routes and destination. Nigerians in Ghana are appealing to Ghanaian authorities to allow a lot more strategic partnership and collaboration in the areas of business, travel and residency to help foster mutually benefiting relations. Acting President of the All Nigeria Community, Chief Bayo Albert Asolu, at a press conference said they are concerned that Nigerians are stereotyped when it comes to crime. I want to appeal to my Nigerian brothers and sisters that uh, if you are in Rome, you behave like Romans. On the land, you know literally nothing about. You step softly. You remember that this is not your own country. That is the first impression you have in your mind. That anything you are coming to do here, you should notice their rules and regulations. The law of the land, you abide by it. That is the only way that you can live successfully in another man's country. The increased utility tariff phase opposition from heavy users of water and electricity, most operators plan to pass a cost on to goods and services. Bill Nebman, no so a was through. It is our best thing out to more. A battery. Existing bills are on the high, and so the increment will be a burden. The business as a whole is not faring well. With the increment, it will make the, um, the, the, the office business and um, prices to go high. Because um, when, the prices are, when the prices are high, the customers might not even bring us the job. And that's when we are going to lose. The Electoral Commission's decision to hold voter registration at district offices is causing backlash from a Farm Plains resident who fear disenfranchisement. Addressing the press in Don Kokrum, MP for Afram Plains North, Betty Nana Efua Crosby Mensa, warns the decision will have financial impacts on the constituents. Given the nature of the constituency, the only reliable means of transport are boats, canoes, and ferries. To assess the district capital, constituents have to travel several kilometers on water and commute by road to Don Kokrum. It will surprise you that the cost involved is as close as 350 Ghana cities to travel from Agodeke on the Duja Island to Donkokro. Well, there's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. Coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, a calls intensifying for an immediate assessment and possible review of the government's flagship Freenia High School program in its current form to achieve optimum results without putting a strain on the economy. We have the key takeaways from our national dialogue held earlier today and we'll be engaging um, the Parliamentary Select Committee on Education on this matter because the speakers on our national dialogue here at TV3 earlier today was made up of the key stakeholders in academia plus also uh, persons who are within the sector of policy formulation. Uh, the former head of the National Development Planning Commission was also director of the Ghana Institute of Management Public Administration, Gimpa, at a point. So he understands what goes on in, into this policy formulation. But let's hear from Dr. Peter Pati Anti uh, earlier today, who was part of the speakers making the point that, yes, the free senior high school policy is good, but there has to be the consideration for the sustainability question to be answered dispassionately. Take a look. 
and as Prof have said, that education is very important. And any uh, program that seeks to give opportunity for everybody to assess education should be applauded. And that is why we have been supporting this policy from the one through write-ups, uh, interviews, and other things. Because we believe that the program needs to be sustained and it needs to go on. It should transcend political parties. It should transcend personalities. And that is why we will continue to support the policy. Now, policies have intended uh, outcomes and then unintended outcomes. So normally, when you are looking at a policy like the free senior high school, you are looking at what were the objectives of starting the policy. And that is clear, because if you look at the logo, it tells you that the intention of the originators was to assure, ensure that there is enough access for everybody to go into senior high school. There is quality and there is equity. So as somebody who's been trained as an evaluator, when you want to look at this policy, that is your first point of call. Has the policy been able to create the needed access? And I said, yes. Critical questions that were asked there, the, both from the civil society organization space, as Dr. Peter Pate and today. We'll hear from Kofi Asari shortly, but uh, may speak up Professor Stephen Aday, who has been with the National Development Planning Commission, spoke from the policy perspective, but at the point as well, being the rector of the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration, spoke from the educationist perspective as well on the teething issues with this free senior high school policy. Take a look. It is facing challenges. It must be treated and made better so that Ghanaians will ensure that no child is left behind. In the first place, let me talk about the way forward rather than dealing with uh, always. But if we don't do something about it, the overcrowding, actually God loved us because I expected that during the COVID, our kids may die in their numbers. But God decided that, you know, we are too poor. She shielded the youth, that most of the people who died. But there can be another uh, viral or epidemic which can sweep. When you go and see how many students sleep in a room in some of the secondary schools, Actually, my, I shudder. You go to Prempe College, meant for about 1,000 students, have about 5,000 students. And even before the free HSA, SHS, I went to Krobo Dumasi Secondary School. And I was shocked because there were three levels of the bed. Now it's three. And students had to squeeze to go on them. And so we have a serious one. So nobody issues see anybody who thinks that we should improve free SHS is an enemy of a regime or anybody else. But it's good for Ghana that we do so. Let me say a few specific things as to the way forward. First of all, no country, and I say no country of significance, if you go to some small island, that's not, which offers free secondary school, provides boarding, free boarding to them. Nowhere. In America, I stayed there. My children grew up there when I was in the UN. Before then, I, my children were in school in Britain. I've lived in Namibia when I was the U head of the UN there in South Africa. No country can afford to maintain the inherited boarding system. Free SHS requires quality, and the emphasis is on quality community schools. We must, as I said, stop making free SHS a doctrine so that it is this. We started this way, and it will be so forever. No, it must evolve. And in that way, it will become better. Well, so some profound thoughts there by Professor Stephen Aday. 
that the people who have been raising questions about this particular policy should not be seen as the enemies for that policy. But he wasn't known about these concerns uh, regarding the overcrowding in the senior high schools. We had some parents as well who took part in the conversation. But Angel Kabono was also here with us, president of the National Association of Graduate Teachers, NAGRAT. He spoke on this, the reality of the situation in the senior high schools, plus the issues regarding overcrowding as well and the feeding challenge. Take a look. That buffer stock arrangement is causing, is adding cost. And let me give you an example. If a school is around a juice where maize is cheap, why can't the school just go to the market gates and buy maize and it ought to be supplied by buffer stock? Let us do a forensic audit of the cost of items that some of these centralized bodies are giving to government to pay. And then you begin to understand why we are having the cost that we're talking about. Look, you see, the feeding situation is this, is this that you have to wait for somebody to mobilize food, food items, and come and supply to you. When we have, we had, we ha we have a history of schools purchasing food items from the time of St. God in God's back. So all of a sudden, what we have mastered in doing by the schools having contracts with uh, suppliers be became null and void, and a central body of people who did not have a history of food supply started supplying food to the schools. And you know something? You have headmasters from one school going around trying to do butter trade. Mm -hmm. That they brought me so much rice. Mm -hmm. So if you also have so much Gary, can we exchange? exchange? Yeah. <laughs> because the buffer stock people cannot understand the numbers and the dynamics of the numbers within the schools. So mm -hmm. I wonder why we today, 2023, we believe in centralized distribution of food items. When there is comparative advantage in terms of price with location of, because when you go to the northern part, the yam will be cheaper. When you come to the south, it will be more expensive. When you get to around central uh, Ashanti, the uh, Jisoo area, the, the, the maize will be cheaper. So the schools know how to manage these things. It is taken away from them with the intention of fighting corruption. But I cannot, it's just shifting corruption. <laughs> Do you, you see, the reason why we have overcrowding is because, one, placement is problematic. As we speak, every parent wants the child to go to about 60 senior high schools in this country. We all know the 60 uh, senior high schools in this country. Because the 60 senior high schools provide 80% of students to the traditional universities. We are talking about the prem pairs, the achimotes, and But today... The overcrowding is affecting that quality education that we admire, that we want all our children to go. When you provide facilities equitably distributed and present in the schools, then it does not matter which school your child goes because you are going to get quality education anyway. Well, so that's Angel Carbono there. Now, stay with me. Let's go on to the Zoom now. And uh, Dr. Kuminata Park is the Bosa South Member of Parliament. He's the Deputy Ranking Member on the Education Committee of Parliament. Dr. Kuminata Park, thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. So this was a progressive conversation we had earlier with academia, policy makers, and then also uh, the civil society. Now, for you, as the... Education Committee of Parliament, these proposals that were made, because I you know you listened, how do you intend to sustain the conversation so that there'll be some meaningful impact from these proposals that were made earlier today? Well, I think it is in order to commend Media General and your good self for taking the initiative. I believe most Ghanaians and many stakeholders have been yearning for a platform where non-politicians would have the opportunity to speak to the free senior school policy and to bring to the fore 
the challenges uh, with the hope that that will trigger the need for a national conversation on the way forward. Um, I'm currently in my constituency, but at least I was able to catch a glimpse of aspects of the forum and various presentations made today. And I must say that I was impressed with the divergent views. And I was also consoled by the fact that everyone agrees, as I do, that the policy is a good policy and that it is serving us well, but that it can serve us better if we address the challenges that we have all become aware of in light of its implementation. So media general ought to be commended. But my takeaway from what I heard is that this should serve as a, a buffer or if you like a foundation for government to build upon by taking it a notch higher in convening a national stakeholders forum for us to have a much more holistic conversation on the sustainability of the policy and in particular how we are going to address some of the implementation challenges. In the area of sustainability, that clearly has to do with our ability as a nation to mobilize the requisite resources to maintain the program and to address the challenges. Now, when we say sustaining it, what form is that going to take? What quantum of resources will be needed? What is going to be the source of those resources? Could that mean, for example, that we should consider the option of targeting, as was suggested by some of the panelists? Could that mean we should look at a model where those who earn an income of a certain threshold should be allowed to provide some support to complement what government is providing? Could it also mean that we should look at making the full policy available to segments of society who earn below a certain income? Or should we look at the possibility of creating a specific revenue stream intended to finance the program? But you see, all of these are options. And the only way that we can have a clear sense of what the best option would be is through a national stakeholders forum. Now, remember too that the IMF, in granting us the bailout, also made references to the free national school policy. In particular, the IMF indicated that the way it is currently being implemented was not the best. The fund called for the need to take a second look at it and to look at target. So I think the issue of sustainability would definitely invoke the need for a national stakeholders forum. forum on this matter, and that's exactly um, the, the reason why this all-important conversation we had earlier today uh, was, was meant to have that focus 
of creating the pathway for this national stakeholders forum that you propose. But Dr. Clementa Park, thank you very much for joining us. Going ahead of me to answer a number of the questions I intended to ask. He is the deputy ranking member on the Education Committee of Parliament, the Bursa South Member of Parliament. But we had a, a parent and also the representatives of the Trade Union Congress, TUC, with us earlier today, um, Madam Na Yelia Defio, who also shared experience as a parent with this fishing high school policy and proposals from the TUC what can be done to also improve on the quality and the question of sustainability. Take a look. The, 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 the onus and the focus is on one more than the other. I think that those synergies must be built so that for people who are ordinary people who are sending their parents, uh, their, their, sorry, their children through the system, we would have the, uh, 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 our money's worth in, 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 if we have to contribute. And I don't mind paying as a, a parent to send my children uh, through the school because I didn't ask for free SHS anyway. Mm. You know, mm. even though a constitution and uh, legal documents may require that, I am ready because that is the reason I, I, I go to work to take care of my family. And that is for me, I should be given the opportunity to do that. So if it is decided as a country, this is the way to go. Let us look at what would, and then also not just uh, of course, we have operated this system for five years, I understand. Doing a review of it, let's do a thorough review, you know, and include all the areas that are being talked to us about now. And for me, I agree with you absolutely, Kofi. If we should uh, do away with uh, corruption thoroughly, we should be able to fund our education as we have been told. It's, sometimes it's too painful. You don't know if the people who are supposed to be managing us are the ones, or we are the ones who are actually not you know, uh, giving them the support that they are supposed to have. Sometimes you, you just get confused. And I want to ask, why are private, poor private schools, as we have been told, not part of the free SHS? Is there an answer to that? I would really want to know mm. why. So these are questions indeed, and, and, and really appreciate the, the contributions from the TUC represented by Nayeli Adefio, you just heard from her. But this is Ghana tonight, and this conversation continues beyond the four walls of Media General because it's extremely important to bother us on the development of the next generation for that matter. But coming up next, preparations underway for the government to facilitate another Christian pilgrimage to Israel. But what is the extent of the state's involvement? And are the taxpayers' funds being committed to this? We seek answers from the Chieftain's Ministry on this particular one and, and whether there's going to be any cost element in this facilitation by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, uh, in fact, the Ministry of Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs on this matter. We'll be back shortly after this quick break. We have a statement just coming through as well on this particular issue. Right after that, we'll hear from both a representative from the Chieftain's Ministry and then also a lecturer in religious affairs at the University of Ghana, Legon, on this. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to demonstrate to you the superior properties of flamingo paint as compared to other paint brands on the market. We take equal quantities of flamingo paint and this ordinary paint. We then dilute them with water. And now, let the test begin. The gentleman on the left is going to apply the ordinary paint and the gentleman on my right will use the flamingo superior paint. As you can clearly see, flamingo has the obvious better hiding. Furthermore, flamingo has painted a much larger area you know one bucket of flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market flamingo paint is made with superior formulation to give superior durability superior hiding superior coverage flamingo paint simply superior hey ojam you're looking good oh my friend is there something you're not telling me? Yes, I'm feeling very good and strong. What is the secret? It is not a secret. My farmer used Yara Miller Activa on me two weeks after planting. This 
boosted my growth. Then after, he used Yarabella Sulfan as top dressing when I was at knee length. My goodness and strength is because of Yaramela Activa and Yarabella Sulfan. Yara fertilizers have nitrite based fertilizers that are readily available for plant upkeep and do not over acidify the soil. Yara fertilizers also contain micronutrients such as zinc, boron and manganese which aid in yield and crop quality. If you want to look good like me, then your farmer must go for Yara fertilizers. They are available in accredited agri-input shops nationwide. For more information, call 0308-251-060 or visit our webpage at yara.com.gh or Facebook page. And there is more. Yara retailers can also benefit from selling Yara products by just downloading Yara Connect app and scanning QR codes on the Yara sack at the point of sale to end rewards. Use Yara fertilizers for better yields and quality produce. You are a major stakeholder in nation building. Your voice matters. Start your day with us. We simplify the conversations, break down the jargons and technicalities. We keep you well informed throughout the week. Start your day with us. We give the leaders the mandate to govern our affairs. We have a responsibility to hold them to account. It begins here. Start your day with us. Good morning, Ghana, Africa, and the rest of the wonderful world. Welcome to Sunrise on 3FM 92.7. Start your day well informed. Start with us on Sunrise on 3FM 92.7. Catch Sunrise Morning Show with me, Johnny Hughes, Helena Piampofo, and William Asidu. Weekdays from 5.55 a.m. to 10 a.m. Only on 3FM 92.7. Your urban lifestyle radio. Age-old rivalries that senior high schools had back then is still present in alumni. Jolali, now or never, we are here to represent our school, St. Mary's Senior High School, Mary's for short. Repping at the Saddle College, Santa Claus, you live in the house. And we are representatives of Winneba Senior High School. You are missing one contestant, your old student, Shatawali. The battle for bragging rights to a particular endeavor remains, of course, still after school. St. Mary's in the lead! Okay, okay, okay. The heat will be on in the kitchen right here on TV3 on Sunday, 5 p.m. Kitchen Wars Season 2 shows Sundays at 5 p.m. on TV3. Don't miss it. Sponsored by Gino Tomato Mix. And Napa Foods. Say Napa. And yeah, on Soko. PGL. Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. We're live on 23 Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration has issued an internal circular. That's what you see on the screen there, announcing the 2023 Christian pilgrimage to Israel. In this statement that you see, the ministry said that the dates for the pilgrimage, which will be in three parts, will be from September 22 through to November 30, 2023. Now, there's been some fundamental questions raised about the state's involvement in this. This is not the first time this is coming up, okay? Um, why the state should be involved in, in any form or shape in uh, officers who are interested in participating in this Christian pilgrimage going through the process. So Richard Obing Boafo is Deputy Director and Head of Religious Affairs Unit of the Ministry of Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs. Also Dr. Ben Willie Golo, a Senior Lecturer at the Department for the Study of Religion at the University of Ghana, Lagon. 
Gentlemen, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana. Tonight, start off with you, uh, Mr. Albin Boafo. What, give me details of this facilitation by the state for persons who want to take part in this Christian pilgrimage. What does it entail, this facilitation you talk about? No, please. Uh, for now, it's not costing the state any money because uh, there will be programs uh, to pay for the yeah, their yeah, yeah, cost. They are, they are to handle their own cost. Uh, more because uh, we we had to suspend the program during COVID, and we are just resuming. I see. So you're saying that the there's no now for now there's no cost involved, or it will not cost the state or the taxpayer anything for now. But is there any point in the process that the state will be made to commit some funds, taxpayers' money to this? It's possible, but for now, uh, they, they, we, we are not uh, constrained in the budget. Uh, would be uh, programs who have to pay their yeah. I see, but that's why I want to understand um, if what you mean by the for now, because if this involves a process, would there be any point that there will be some cost element to it? Uh, yes. Yes, for now, for this particular one, we, we want the pilgrims to pay for their own fares, accommodation, but it's a package, so they, once they pay the package, it covers everything. I see. But for the, for the purposes of clarity, if you talk about facilitation, but then you also say that pil pilgrims are going to bear the full cost of everything, then what are you taking care of? Okay, so the facilitation is that we we have link up with the uh, the Israel authorities, and uh, once uh, we also have a screening committee in place. So uh, internally, we have a screening committee that will screen applicants. Uh, once uh, we screen applicants, we we will some will be passed definitely, some will not pass. Those who pass through the screening will be presented to the embassy to be issued. Uh, uh, it's going to be a group visa, to be issued visas to uh, go and see the holy site. The ministry will, will through a tour operator, will, will facilitate the traveling itinerary, uh, both uh, locally and then in Israel. I see. Well, let me bring in uh, Dr. Golo uh, at this point. So this clarity about no costs involved, at least for now, as you've just heard Mr. Boa for talk about, does it s answer the question about why the state should be involved in this and, and the fact that really because he says there's no cost to the state or the taxpayer, it's just from a form of facilitation. Does it answer the question of the relevance of the state in all of this? Uh, yeah, once again, good evening and good evening to your your viewers. Um, um, I think we've been here before and um, we, we had the same explanation. Um, I don't want to use the word excuse. I mean, it's an explanation that they gave that uh, they aren't uh, funding, they are just facilitating. And uh, the question that remains to be asked is why would they um, <laughs> facilitate uh, pilgrim, I mean pilgrims or pilgrimage to uh, Jerusalem in the sense that uh, if they were doing it on a corporate basis in the sense that they have maybe um, workers, civil servants, or probably people in the in their own ministry or any other ministry, government agency, and they are doing it as a corporate body for them, that would be understood, right? But if they are doing it uh, just uh, generally for people who want to go, then that 
remains a little bit of a problem because um, that is not supposed to be the job of government. Um, they could facilitate if religious groups, Christian groups intend to visit those places. And if for one reason or the other, they are having challenges with, let's say visa acquisition or something of the sort, or even with coordination with um, the, I mean, the Ghanaian mission there in Israel, or even with any other institution in Israel, then if they come in to do that, that is fair and reasonable, you know. But if they should start the process of trying to say we are organizing, um, which of course, if you look at the letter, the, the circular that is sent, indicated that it does look like they are organizing the, I mean, the uh, pilgrimage, you know, then that remains a little bit of a challenge as to why they would do that. You know, so that is my take on the uh, issue uh, as to why they would start the process. Why would it originate from the, why should, why should it, they be the ones organizing it? You know, so that remains a question that we have to probe. So, 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 so last question to you. So I want you to respond to that particular concern that, oh, so why are you facilitating this the, the question that uh, doctor is raising that is it the business of the state to facilitate this and not bringing that conversation about equality or fairness because the muslim pilgrims go to the your, your, your last your, your last question on this this particular concern that they raise yes and then uh uh, we, we, we are in contact with uh, uh, tour, uh, we have a tour operator we are, we are dealing with. So the, the tour operator will handle them in Israel and then take them to their sites and then uh, bring them back to Ghana. Yes, but so that... it's more like we are, we are giving them the enabling environment to uh, make the trip. So are you saying that without the state getting involved, I mean, what do you mean by enabling environment? What what's the business of the state really in this? Well, I I will not go that that lane uh, because I I I think that uh, the state uh, has has a far reaching on our values, and uh, our values also contribute to development. So the more people get to know the updates, the updates values also change for the better. And uh, we, we know that the Israel trip, the objective of the trip is to uh, increase the, to strengthen the, the, or to give opportunities to uh, adherents, religious adherents, especially Christians to uh, deepen their faith. And so we, we, we think that uh, at least they, they cannot do it on their own. So helping them uh, do it, I mean, it's in line. But, I mean, they, they go, they apply for, for visas. But so, uh, Dr. Golo, this explanation of creating an enabling environment, the Christian cannot do it on their own. And so the state is stepping in to do so. Does it suffice from where you sit? Well, you see, um, there are many dimensions the whole thing, okay? For which reason, uh, if they are not funding it or the taxpayer is paying um, a zero peso, okay, it should be a little bit worrying is that, um, I mean, times have passed that people have been to uh, pilgrimages in, 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 uh, in Jerusalem. Right, and this ministry um, has not been involved. Okay, then what has changed suddenly that this particular ministry wants to do this? Now, as a scholar of uh, 
religion or on, on church state relationships. You would see this from quite a number of perspectives, but basically two. Okay. One is that um, to say, well, it's an issue of what you would call uh, justice and and fair play in the sense that, well, if government has been involved in the organization or facilitation of our brothers on the other side, our brothers and sisters on the, on the other side, Muslims, therefore, if they do not do it for Christians, maybe there may be qualms, fine. So if they come from that perspective of the issue of fair play and justice, which of course, I, I, I hear some fellow Christians make that argument, which for me personally, I think is um, a little bit worrying. You know, uh, the fact that government organizes um, or facilitates passage to Mecca for Muslims must not be an equalization ground for Christians to equally ask for same because um, <clears throat> there is no necessary link between Christianity and pilgrimage to Jerusalem. But there is a necessary link between Islam and pilgrimage to Mecca, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, when the argument is even made on that ground, on issue of fairness and justice, um, on the surface of it, it's, it sounds fair, but when you dig a little bit down, you realize that <clears throat> there are more questions, I mean, to be asked. Also, you would also realize that there's also what we call the issue of legitimacy. Now, this goes two ways, okay? When religious groups uh, have uh, these partnerships or whatever with state or sorry when the state rather moves into partnership with religious groups it is because the state kind of wants legitimacy from religious groups which is not a problem okay because um citizens are, are, i mean who are the constituencies of the state are also members of religious communities. Okay. But then it takes, it, it, you, you also answer that fundamental question about the fact that it doesn't lie within the business of the state to even be doing this. If people have been going on this pilgrimage on their own and by themselves all the while. Thank you very much. Dr. Ben Willie Golo, Senior Lecturer, Department for the Study of Religion at the University of Ghana. And to you, Richard Obeng Boafo, Deputy Director head religious affairs unit ministry of chieftaincy and religious affairs but up next the securities and exchange commission has been reacting to the recent developments on men's gold especially because nanapia mensa has started talking again making promises to start payment from next month and at a point even asked these customers of defunct men's gold to pay some 650 cities which eventually withdrew earlier now, he's been talking on Twitter Spaces, talking about some payments to commence soon. But the Securities and Exchange Commission has also, according to them, been monitoring what Nanapia Mensa Nam, Nam One, as popularly called, has been saying over the last two days. Take a look at the head of uh, external communications of SEC responding to these questions. The attention of the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, has been drawn to a letter currently circulating, allegedly from Men's Code Ghana, which purports to entreat clients to pay a specified sum of money and have their claims subsequently paid. The SEC is urgently investigating the issue and will provide the needed updates to the public as and when they become you. The SEC forwarded the original case file of men's code to the Attorney General and the Economic and Organized Crimes Office, Yoko, 
who are currently handling the issue to the best of our knowledge. The SEC would also like to warn the general public about the emergence of numerous fraudulent schemes operating within the country. would like to point your attention to some of the characteristics of these schemes so that you would be able to identify them and avoid them with the utmost care. First and foremost, these schemes are not licensed by the SEC or any other regulator within the Ghanaian financial sector. Secondly, they also guarantee very high returns with little or no risk. It's important to note that every investment comes with a certain degree of risk. So if an entity offers you very high returns and guarantees little or no risk, be sure to avoid such an entity. Thirdly, they also offer very complex and difficult to understand products uh, that have no fundamental business model. If you do not understand the investment, think twice before entering into such an investment. If in doubt, please call the SEC on 0800 1065. You can also send us an email at info at sec.gov.gh or visit our website at www.sec.gov.gh to see a list of operators licensed to operate within the Ghanaian securities market. Well, so that's Godwin answer, but Amanda Clinton is a lawyer to some of the men's gold customers. She's joining us on Zoom. Amanda, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. So beyond this caution by the Securities and Exchange Commission, would you expect that they do more, apart from just telling these customers that don't pay, don't fall prey to the new scheme of Nanapia Mensa? This, he has been talking recently. Can the SEC do more than just a caution? I think I, I'm encouraged by it. I think I, I, I listened to, was it Dr. Ansa, head of communication at SEC, a little earlier on, on one of your radio stations today. And I'm very encouraged by it because he also mentioned that they had forwarded the earlier file um, to the Attorney General's office and Yoko. And so he almost hinted that he would be working with, with those two and I'm, I'm encouraged by it uh, because SEC in 2018 had issued um, a, a, a warning uh, to men's goals directing them that no new contracts should be created. And they also said that all adverts of the business be halted. And so in saying all adverts of the business be, be halted, in a... a in my definition, that would include paid and unpaid in terms of what they're doing now with this digital um, verification access code. So I'm very encouraged and, and hopefully it will lead more things. I see. But then again, I'm just looking at this statement um, that you put out there earlier. And th the last time we spoke, I recall you made the point that you had secured a judgment against Nanapia Mens, but you couldn't execute it because you couldn't find any property in his name. All the men's gold buildings and others were not for him. Now that he started making promises that he's going to start paying in the coming months, at least the last time he spoke two days ago, does that give you any ammunition to now revive the fight for the clients that you represent to be paid their monies? Of course, but I mean, I, I also think that uh, the authorities in terms of Yoko um, uh, and CID, uh, who, who often work together, are also in, in a very good position to um, work with SEC to find out what assets he's exactly referring to or what money he's referring to. Uh, because at the end of the day, it is not for Namwon to distribute as he um, deems fit through this verification process. Um, he's facing 61 charges, including money laundering and operating without a license. And as such, um, he is not fit to operate without a license. That was the whole point of his operation being shut down. So it, it, it is also for Yoko um, and CID to be looking into whether there is more money and if so, to cull it in order to distribute it to far more people um, than, for instance, uh, Namwon deciding who to dis distribute it to. But I have no hope that there is uh, money that he's talking about. And if there is, then it is for SEC and Yoko to deal with. 
Um, what I also feel quite strongly about in terms of what SEC has come out with today is that because they're saying they're going to be working in investigating this matter, they hinted at Yoko and Attorney General's office. It, 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 it's, it's helpful because um, with Act 30, it says that the court may refuse bail if the offence the accused is charged with was committed whilst on bail and the punishment exceeds six months. So, for instance, if this investigation reveals that um, there was a form of deposit taking uh, with his acts and carrying on the deposit taking business, which would levy further charges on him, then potentially I think his, his bill could be revoked, um, which, you know, which would mean that the one billion that was used for his um, bail uh, would, I think, have to be paid into court. Right. Amanda, thank you very much for joining us. Amanda Clinton is lawyer to some of these uh, grieved men's gold customers. Uh, we've been talking after Nanapia Mensa resurfaced again, making promises. But coming up next, uh, we unpack the controversy surrounding the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation and Gensa Energy deal, which involves members of parliament and civil society. Today, you had John Abdullah Jinapo distancing himself and, and that of the, the minority that's members of the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament from a statement that the chair of that committee, Atachia, Samuel Atachia, released a couple of days ago. These are the portions of the statement that he released, um, that Samuel Atachia was the chair of the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament, that relating to the projected potential loss of $1.5 billion by raising of the GMPC, GENSA, GSA, ASEP, and Imani hypothesis is defeated by raising of the following. The above computation confuses the penalties to GMPC for contract termination under the GSA with the loss to GMPC for performing the contract. Ben Boache is Executive Director of the Africa Center for Energy Policy, ASEP. Mr. Boache, thank you for joining us. That's the chair of the committee faulting your analysis that this deal, if entered into, is going to cost the state $1.5 billion. How do you justify this position? You know, they themselves, you know, did not show how that statement is inaccurate. Why Ghana is not losing uh, $1.5 billion. What they just did was to just do some basic arithmetic of the discount to arrive at around 1.4 uh, billion and assumed that that 1.4 is not being lost because GMPC will use the, uh, the, the transmission line over the 16 year period. And that of course uh, doesn't look at the gamut of issues that we have raised uh, on this very transaction. So this is a transaction where GMPC has discounted our gas uh, for a private comp company called Gensa. And the fundamental question that we're asking is, what is GMPC getting in return? Already the agreement has been operational uh, for three years. So it's easy to even assess um, its utilization, the benefits that are coming to GMPC for even that time period. And to date, three years on, zero benefit uh, to GMPC. Gensa has commissioned its pipelines that it is using to serve its customers and getting cheap gas uh, from GMPC that has committed to also use the infrastructure to sell gas to its customers. But GMPC, as we speak today, doesn't have any customer in that enclave to sell power to. The decision by the a minister of energy to send uh, a merry power plant to Kumasi was the only commitment for gas consumption uh, as of last year. And even that, they are still in the process of moving a merry to uh, Kumasi, but the pipeline is concluded and we are paying uh, for that infrastructure. So what the committee could have done was really look at how much it's going to cost this country uh, to build that pipeline and how much can reasonably be paid to amortize that infrastructure 
for that infrastructure to become that of the state. And that was a process that Ghana Gas actually started, you know, where they had this arrangement with Gensa for Gensa to build a pipeline with their own money. And then they will pay them over time with interest. But the arrangement that GMP has with Gensa now only ensures that Gensa continues to own the asset, the national grid infrastructure uh, forever. You know, with the clause for GMP to opt to buy a section of the pipeline after 16 years. And every signal is on the wall that GMPC will not opt to buy the asset. Because if you don't have the millions of dollars you need to construct the pipeline today, what is the guarantee that you will have it tomorrow? Even after you have been drained of $1.5 billion. So these are the risks that this single transaction throws in our faces. And we expected that you know, Parliament will do a good job of actually analyzing the issues. When we were called uh, to appear before the committee, we thought hard about it. We were really reluctant to actually appear before the committee because the committee itself had made some prejudicial comments to the effect that they approved the transaction. So we asked ourselves, what are they really investigating if they thought already that nothing had gone amiss? But we thought we should reconsider that stance and still appear before the committee to try and convince them of the implication of this transaction and also remind them of the state of the energy sector for which the gas uh, component is very key. As we speak, we owe over $600 million for gas that has been consumed to generate power and ECG cannot collect the revenues for uh, GMPC to be able to pay. So the state is the one paying uh, for their gas, right? So if all these realities are there, you expect a parliamentary committee to ask the fundamental question. If the gas is further discounted to generate additional liabilities, mm -hmm. who, you know, will pay for the gas? Because cheap gas anywhere for mm -hmm. uh, GMPC to sell at 2.79. We used so, so I say, and uh, it's a very, very important point that you make there, and it raises some fundamental questions about uh, the committee's considerations, and especially as we're getting to know that the minority uh, has distanced itself from the position taken by the chair of the Committee of Mines and Energy in Parliament. This conversation is not ending anytime soon. Appreciate your time. Uh, ben Bwachi is the Executive Director of the Africa Center for Energy Policy, ASEP. Thank you. On behalf of the rest of the team, I want to thank you so much for staying with us here on Ghana Tonight. Join us same time tomorrow. I am Alfred Kansedu. Have a good night. Ghana Tonight is brought to you by Flamingo Paint. Superior durability. Superior hiding. Superior coverage. Simply superior.